what is Lectio Divina? What's all this about contemplative practice? What is Gnosticism and mysticism? Have you ever heard of perennialism? Today, I'll take you on a journey that I experienced a couple years ago when an organization I was involved with started using some of these practices. So I'll try to answer all your questions on contemplative prayer, Lectio Divina, mysticism, perennialism, and all other questions surrounding those things. Let's get into this. Welcome to Firm Foundation Podcast. My name is Richard Moore. In this podcast, I talk about everything that's moving me in relation to church and theology, hopefully to empower you to build a firm foundation in Jesus Christ. Hey, before we go any further, if you wouldn't mind doing me a huge favor and clicking the like button, hitting the subscribe and smashing that bell, it helps us get this content out to more people. Thanks so much. That's right, folks. Lectio Divina will be our topic today, along with sort of side issues that relate to that, contemplative prayer, perennialism, and the mystic movement. So let's jump into today. I wanted to give you guys a view into what Lectio Divina is. First, define it and then describe it and describe the dangers. I do believe on the front end that Lectio Divina is a dangerous practice that Christians should not be involved in. From the front, I'll just tell you where we're going today. That's where we're going. And I'll describe it, and then we'll go into some details. I'm connected in my missions work with so many different organizations and I want to show you how organizations all across the Christian spectrum are starting to get into and practice Lectio Divina, among other things, contemplative, spirituality, and the like. We'll focus today on Lectio Divina, but again, like I said, these other experiences, these other practices are very adjacent to Lectio Divina. So let's jump in. Like I said, I'm in my mission work, I have touched with all sorts of different Christian organizations, and Lectio Divina has come up as of late with a vengeance. I mean, this practice is becoming more and more popular. It is a little bit off the topic of my discussion that I typically discuss, which is the New Apostolic Reformation and its sort of uh, movements and other uh, issues related to that, but this has lots to do with that. I believe that contemplative life, the contemplative movement is making headway into the New Apostolic Reformation, and it is very, very popular anyways, listening to God, the whole type, that whole type of thing. And so it is very related to my main topic, which I typically deal with, but this is uh, extra special in that uh, the progressive Christian also does this practice quite a bit, and we'll have a look at that today. So I was first alerted to this recently. Again, I knew about it, of course, growing in Bible college, going to Bible college, you see all this stuff and you're, you know the history of the church. And so I'm aware of Lectio Divina since, since then, since Bible college at least, and historical theology as, as well. So we go through church history and those things, and I knew that and, and was aware of it, of Lectio Divina as a practice, but most recently uh, I was a, became aware of a retreat from a mission organization that offered Lectio Divina as a part of their retreat. As a matter of fact, it was a silent retreat. And so they offered it, and we'll go over what I experienced and how I um, experienced that and experienced the materials for that retreat. And I will give you the people that they talked about, the resources, all that. First of all, let me just kind of lay out what Lectio Divina is. Lectio Divina is a practice where the participant seeks to immerse themselves in the text of Scripture. Now, from the beginning, let's say that this is a noble effort, a noble thing that people would want to immerse themselves in, 
the scripture, to understand it better, to have a better grasp. And uh, but but the way in which it's done, I believe, is not spiritually safe for us. It's also not prudent, and it actually doesn't line up with common hermeneutical principles. And hermeneutics is just the science of interpretation of ancient texts. And we basically mostly apply the word hermeneutics to scriptural interpretation. Now, there's a, there's a particular science, a way that the Bible ought to be understood and interpreted. And I believe that Lectio Divina steps outside of that proper hermeneutical principle and how we ought to interpret the Bible. I'll hopefully give you an idea of that today. So Lectio Divina is this practice through which the participant visualizes or repeats or or, or does repetitive reading of a text, um, as well as speaking or repeating divine words that they find in the text. And everyone who practices this, as I'm looking, as I'm researching, practices this sort of differently, but many start with a form of preparation. And in that preparation, they invite God to speak to you or speak to the participant and prepare your mind by emptying your mind, uh, collecting your thoughts, calming your mind, etc. So again, like I said, there's many, many ways to do it, but most people do it with some step of preparation where they come to, they open their Bible in some way and then invite God to speak, preparing your mind by emptying it or collecting your thoughts or or calming yourself, or, or any other means of preparation, of, of centering yourself, calming yourself, which centering is also not a, a, a biblical or a scriptural practice. It is uh, centering prayer, which is also part of these things. There's all sorts of aberrant uh, practices that could be uh, taken on in this practice. So centering yourself, coming to uh, to rest, coming to peace and all that type of stuff. That, those can be preparations within Lectio Divina. Then uh, the participant does the Lectio, which actually, I'm sorry to back up a little bit. Lectio Divina means divine reading in Latin. Actually, the name is sort of a misnomer, is that this type of reading that you're going to be participating in is more divine or more divine than just reading it by studying it. So that's already a misnomer in that you would say that I'm coming to the text and doing this practice, it is more divine or I will get more from God than I would if I just read it for what it says. And that's a misnomer. It's a, it's a deception, I believe, actually, because the scriptures are perspicuous. There's a theological perspective called the perspicuity of scripture in which the text of scripture, it says the text of scripture is perspicuous, it's understandable, it's clear, God sends a message. There's no hidden meaning that you have to unearth by digging, digging, digging. It's perspicuous for all people, all times, at all places. And so this is one of the main problems I have with this form of scripture reading is that it assumes that there is a more divine way to read a text. And that really lends itself to a few things. It, it lends itself to a elite Christian perspective that says, well, I have a more divine reading than, let's say, Joe Schmo over there who's not doing Lectio Divina or reading, he's just reading the text for what it says. And so uh, this lends to that I know it, I have a deeper spirituality than that person over there. So this is mainly the, the overall overarching problem with this form of reading of the text. So then they move into, after they pre prepare, they go into the Lectio, which is the reading. So Lectio Divina, the participant reads the passage on the first read and only looks for words that stick out. Um, they just see what hits them, basically. And so they're looking for words, though, not necessarily what the words altogether mean, which is also another improper hermeneutical principle. If, if I were to read a book of any type and I just look and I read maybe a paragraph and I only look for words that sort of stick out to me, I'm not actually understanding the entire meaning of what the author has written. So if I'm just reading a book and I'm looking for information, actually, I'm, it's a sort of an informative book, I read it. 
and I only look for words that stick out, then I'm reading it improperly. I'm reading for the message that the author is trying to communicate, not particular words. Now, particular words might put together a message, but you have to put them all in context. That's why context is king. Context, context, context is one of the most important hermeneutical principles. You only understand scripture through its context. And the same goes for any reading. If I'm reading any literature, I have to understand the context. First of all, the context of where the author wrote, maybe the context of who he's writing to, his audience. Maybe I'm not his number one me audience. Then I have to understand the context within the context of what he's written. Say I read one chapter only. That's just a part of the context of the entire book. So context is king. That's the principle of hermeneutics. So when you actually read this and you read a lec the, the Lectio, the first reading that you would read of a passage of Scripture within this Lectio Divina practice, it is saying, I'm taking the things that jump out at me and not taking the passage for the whole. Then the second reading, you would read through a second time in the Lectio Divina practice, and it was it's called the Meditatio or the Reflection or Reflecting. Then the person reflects on what they believe God is saying. So they take those impressions, those few words maybe, and they try to understand what God is saying, what they believe God is saying. So Lectio Divina says not to fall into the trap of Bible study as well. Don't just study it or study the Bible or read it as if you were studying it. And so that's also a, a challenging, dangerous thing because a book, whatever a book you have happen to read is trying to get a message. So Sometimes you have to study things then to understand what that message may be. Then comes the third reading. So you, after you've read it twice, now with this Lectio, the first reading, Meditatio, the second reading, and then Oratio, comes the response. Either you journal or you respond in some way to God, what God is saying by highlighting words from the text. Again, this is where that first reading kind of comes into play. You go back and say, okay, what were those words again? And pull those out of the text and again, this conflicts with basic hermeneutical principles that you would look at the text in the context and not try to take those things out of its context. Otherwise, you might actually be misunderstanding the text of what was written there. So when you actually take words out of its context or take even verses out of its context, if you just take individual verses of Scripture out of their context, Sometimes they can reflect or portray a meaning that is not reflected by the context. So that's the danger of taking anything out of context. If you take my words out of context or another person's words out of context, we're in the middle of the presidential elections and <laughs> the, the other parties are taking each other's words out of context. And that's pretty typical because you know that they, they're not really reflecting what they wanted to say, and you're creating a meaning for that person's words of which they did not mean by taking them out of context. So that's pretty typical in politics. It's not a new thing in this election cycle, friends, I promise you. <laughs> um, so politicians have been doing that for quite some time, taking people's words out of context because they know that it can create a bad look for the political, their own political opponent. So that's um, the problem here as well. You take this oratio, then you respond, and then you take these words. And then the final step of, of Lectio Divina is contemplatio, or rest, or co contemplation. Uh, this is where the most participants are asked to spend about 10 to 15 minutes in silent contemplation. Not saying anything, listening, opening themselves up, emptying yourselves, not talking, only silence, allowing God to work. So in Lectio Divina, the chosen spiritual text is read four times in total, giving an opportunity to think deeply about it and respond thoughtfully. Um, when we practice Lectio Divina, we can imagine we're actually involved in the events of Scripture. That's another thing they try to ask you to do is to insert yourself into the text of Scripture. I received the program for a retreat that this mission organization, funny enough, was putting on, and they had a section of Lectio Divina involved in the program. And in this program, they asked the participants to place themselves into the text of Scripture. 
And the text that they had chosen was blind Bartimaeus. And, and they asked the participants, what does it feel like in Jericho? Place yourselves there. What, is the, what are the smells, the tastes, the touch? What do you sense when you... And then you see blind Bartimaeus. And what do you sense? What do you see? What do you feel? What do you hear? All these things. So placing yourselves in the text of Scripture. And I'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. Lectio Divina is a distinctly Catholic form of Scripture interpretation. Lectio Divina is a practice that has also produced Catholic theologies that evangelicals and Protestants disagree with deeply. So why would evangelicals practice something that has produced Catholic mysticism? So let's go over to my desktop here, and I have uh, lots of things to go through with y'all to show you what Lectio Divina is. I found this as well, this describing what I kind of just described to you. This is uh, a blog, I take it. And uh, so one of the things that uh, has become really popular, here's a tool I found, uh, how to do the Lectio Divina prayer and, and Bible reading. And so it goes through and describes it. And this was, if I'm not mistaken, I found this on the 24-7 prayer website, which is here. Let's go to the homepage. 24-7 prayer website. So let's just go back real quick. This is the homepage of the 24-7 prayer movement, which also has connections naturally, of course, to IHOP and to the 24-7 global prayer movement. Now, this prayer movement, the one that this website has relation to is Pete Gregg, uh, was the guy who wrote this famous poem on the wall in a prayer house that they had. And here's the, here's the prayer. It's a vision, you know, we're untethered to things and, you know, this kind, kind of thing. Every soldier take a bullet for his comrade in arms. We're waiting, we're watching, we're a better generation. It's very, very arrogant, very, very proud. We're better than everybody else. Let me just actually read it to you. So, uh, the vision. The vision is Jesus, obsessively, dangerously, undeniably Jesus. The vision is an army of young people. You see bones, I see an army. And they are free from materialism. We are free from materialism. No, Everybody else struggles with materialism, not us, not this generation, which struggle with materialism. I was part of the generation. I remember when this started. <laughs> it's just laughable. Honestly, sorry. P. Greg might be a nice guy, a great guy, but the the hubris is astounding. We were all in that generation. We were the most materialistic up to that point. Our boomer parents gave us everything we wanted. We had video games. We had we, Nintendo. The 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 outset of video games was our generation. Okay, so but people who involved in this prayer movement were free of materialism. They laugh at nine to five little prisons again. People have to work. Yeah. Anyways, they could eat caviar on Monday and crusts on Tuesday. Sure, sure they could. They wouldn't even notice. Of course they wouldn't because they're above all of that, you know. <laughs> they know the meaning of the matrix. I don't know what he's talking about that. Is he talking about the movie um, or is he talking about getting stuck in that matrix? The Yeah, anyways. The way the West was won. They are mobile, like the wind. They belong to the nations. They need no passport. People write their addresses in pencil and wonder at their strange existence. Like we are homeless people. We don't need place to live. <laughs> kind of. All right. I don't know why, why this was such a powerful vision to him. I guess he thinks this is more biblical than not. I, I don't know. They are free, yet they are slaves of the hurting and dirty and dying. What is the vision? The vision is holiness that hurts the eyes. It makes children laugh and adults get angry. All right, so, yeah. It gave up the game on minimum integrity long ago to research, reach for the stars. It scorns the good and strains for the best. It's dangerously pure. Yeah, so... So much more, so much more than the last generation. The last generation wasn't dangerously pure enough. It's just... The whole I read the whole thing. I just think we're better than y'all. That that's just what it feels like to me. Um, so 
I don't need to read the whole thing. You can go read it. It's on the 24 seven prayer website, but I wanted to point this out. I wasn't even trying. I just came across this and then here's the 24 seven or 25 years of prayer. So they also claim as the IHOP does, there was 25 years of uninterrupted prayer, which is not accurate. There were portions and times and gaps when no one was praying, but it also it, it just let me just let it play for you. The hubris that comes out is really amazing. It's like no one was praying before we started 25 years ago. No one in all of history prayed. And so let's just have a look at this. This is interesting. It opened up with this. If the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough. And that's from Meister Eckhart. <laughs> it start, starts off on a wrong foot. Here we go. Meister Eckhart was a monk, a Catholic priest, a theologian in the from 1260 to 1328. He was born in Gotha um, in Turingen in central Germany. Eckhart uh, came into prominence during the uh, Avignon Pap Papacy at the time of the increased tensions between the orders, um, Eckhart's Dominican order and the Franciscan order. In later life, he was accused of heresy and brought up before the local Franciscan-led Inquisition and tried as a heretic by Pope John the Twenty Second. Um, so interesting. Uh, even in, I mean, of course, people who are condemned. Jan Hus was condemned as a heretic, and he was not a heretic. He was probably the most faithful man of the Word of God in his day and age. But so I'm not saying that just because you are condemned as a heretic means that you, you know were a heretic. Even Catholics can't claim Meister Eckhart. He was a heretic. He was condemned as a heretic. So, and probably died before he was even be able to be executed as a heretic. He also is well known for groups with pious lay groups as the Friends of God. This is also has uh, if influence in the IHOP and 24-7 prayer movement. He has acquired his status as a great mystic within contemporary popular spirituality. And so people in the prayer movement, people in the 24-7 movement, people in the IHOP movement call on Meister Eckhart a lot, but I'm going to say he's a dangerous source for truth or for spirituality. Let's just, I'm just going to say that. And then even the quote, if the only prayer you ever pray in your entire life is thank you, it'll be enough. So, but the 24-7 prayer movement wants you to pray for 24 hours a day and seven days a week. So which is it? Is it thank you is enough and that's all you need to pray or you need to pray for 24 7. just a question sometimes a moment seeds a movement and i think this if i'm not mistaken this is pete greg in the in this video here Oh, and then he says, a place receives a certain grace. This is also part of the NAR. So there's these crossovers here. Uh, NAR has special uh, thin places or places with more grace than other places. For instance, Bethel, whom I cover quite a bit, is a place where there is thinner. The space between heaven and earth is thinner. It's a cancer-free zone, all this stuff. And I quoted all that at length. Benny Johnson, before she passed away, said that Bethel was a thinner place and that and all people throughout the NAR says there's places with extra special grace on them. So you got to go to those places. So prayer houses especially have special grace. It's a little diversion from this idea, but this is what he's saying in here. There's places with extra special grace. And that's actually that actually goes against what Christ said. All right, so let's just jump over here real quick to just show that there are no special extra special places where people ought to worship or that there are extra places with special graces. He's wrong. That's a deeply, deeply problematic theology. And here's why. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you remember, in John 4, 21, he said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem Will you worship the Father? You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is here, when true worshipers will worship the, the, the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, 
and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. There are no high holy places anymore in Christianity. There are no places with extra special grace. You can worship God right where you are, right where you are. And your church, your wherever your church family gathers, where your ecclesia, the called out ones who Christ has saved, wherever y'all gather to worship, that is where you worship. We don't have these places. You don't have even your church building down the street. If it has a steeple and a bell tower, that is not a high holy place. That is not the extra special presence of God place. That is just a place to gather for worship of the most holy God. The hour is coming and now is here. True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Not on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Jesus meaning no extra special holy place. All right, let's go back to this video then. Celebrating 25 years of the 24-7 movement. Okay. <laughs> so a place with extra special grace for him was Penny Lane for the Beatles. Okay. And then Herrenhut for Zinzendorf. You mean the strange sexual cult? Zinzendorf, the more I look into it, the more I find that that was also probably a quite an aberrant movement and not a Christian move of God. They were a cult and they, you know, made people <laughs> worship and pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week, kind of like these guys. So let's have a look further. And like all the thousands of prayer rooms right now around the world, in pubs and clubs and churches, festivals, cathedrals, campuses, and schools. Father, I guess I'm still just bewildered, still surprised, still struggling to find the words to thank you for planting this movement 25 years ago and for what you have been planting ever since in so many places and so many people all around. Yeah, I think that's Pete Gregg, the guy there with the seed. Done immeasurably more than we could have asked or imagined back then before we started praying and before red moon rising and the vision poem <laughs> yeah you see you see the hubris i don't know if you catch it but before we started praying before people were praying nobody was praying before this it, do you catch that I, I hope you catch the extreme arrogance that this movement is the beginning of prayer and so, yeah, I, I caught that before. I just watched it once. This is the first, second time I'm watching it. So, before all those crowds crying, come on, before Ibiza, the first boiler room, before classrooms started. So, boiler rooms were also part of the NAR um, that became part of the NAR. Boiler rooms, the 24 7 prayer movement, the 24 the, the 24 7 burn. These are uh, boiler rooms where. Uh, worship and praise will happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Sean Foyt is part of that. Um, his his burn, the burn 24-7, that's also part of this movement. So these are all spinoffs and, and connected uh, adjacently, not all connected straight away, but mo mainly adjacently. The boiler rooms are, uh, as, as far as I understand it, 24-7 worship is taking place. Turning into prayer rooms before we knew anything about before we knew anything about monasteries, abbeys, Lectio Divina, or anything. And then here are people doing Lectio Divina, apparently. But let me go back. So Ibiza was the, is the island, the party island for all the Germans who, funny enough, all Germans go to Ibiza for, for vacation. I know a ton of people who go to Ibiza. <laughs> There's lots of clubs, apparently, and so they went to Ibiza to try to be missionaries and witness to people, and great motives, uh, but this is what happened then. Before classrooms started turning into prayer rooms, before we knew anything about abbeys and monasteries, Lectio Divina, the Mustard Seed Order. The Mustard Seed Order, that's also, a, I think, Franciscan order. I don't exactly know. True it all, you've been Catholic. Utterly faithful, utterly so thank you, Lord, that for 25 years, 
You've been choosing to use idiots like us. People without money, influence, people too young and idealistic to know what we can't yet do. That is very telling. People too young and idealistic to even tell what they can do. And that's how this movement, the IHOP movement and the 24-7 prayer movement have abused and manipulated youth with their passion and idealism to get them to be part of this thing. And in my opinion, it's abusive. And they, yeah, it, asking people to pray at 3 a.m. And, and fast and do all this radical, radical stuff, it's a fool's errand. God does not demand this of us. He does not demand this of us. This, and this is the Lectio Divina app. And so this girl is doing Lectio Divina, and I'll show you that in a second. They have a full thing on their app where you can walk through and do Lectio Divina. And here she, you know, meditates. Many credit whatsoever for what you have been doing for a quarter of a century in us, with us, and through us, and for us, and in spite of us too. But Father, it feels like we're just getting started. Got to keep going. Got to keep that thing moving. You got to always. 25 years. This turns out to be the beginning. Maybe it's time to take what you have given us and plant something new. Oh, something new is coming. It's always coming. It's always around the corner. You know, uh, you got to pull that, pull the return of Come on, Jesus. And they actually say it. They talk about it in this. Come on, Jesus. Come on back. We need you. Come on back. And they always, they're always around the corner. It's always, you got to, you got to streb dich an in German. Sorry, I got to use some German to kind of give that effect. You have to really, really, really try. Try really, really, really hard. Streb dich an means to like extend yourself and put yourself way out there to try really hard to make something happen. And that's what they're doing. Urgency of the hour. You, you raised us up for this moment. We are the extra special ones that you have raised up. Now, God, does God raise people up? Certainly. But there's this... There's this elitism in this movement, and that, that's what Lectio Divina leads to. In my opinion, Lectio Divina leads to an elitism that you hear from God, extra special as that guy down the road. He can't hear from God because I'm practicing something that's extra special that God really speaks to me through. So. Still crying. Come on, like it's 1999. Come on, Jesus. Come on, let your kingdom come. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Come back. So part of it is just what IHOP did too. Now, I don't know how much they're connected. Pete Gregg is connected with, with Mike Bickle, but they were trying to, you know, call Jesus back. They believe that there's this, that if the fire on the altar goes out, that Jesus will not come back. They are hastening the day of Christ. There's the hastening doctrine that believes that Jesus will come back if we if we plead with him enough, if we call him enough. Come on, come on, come soon. Here you go, all this stuff. And so now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So that's the 25 year prayer movement. And um, here is their website, like I said, with the vision. And then here's the podcast. They have 24 7 hour podcast. I'm going to go back to this page over here, which shows the Lectio 365 app. I guess it's an app. Not exactly sure. Yeah. For iPhone, for Android, daily devotional app that helps you Lectio the Bible, or read the Bible every day, pray the Bible. Sorry. The Bible is not meant to be prayed. 
I mean, there are sections that are prayers for sure, and we we are we should be feel free to repeat those and pray those to God, but it's meant to be read. It's meant to be understood. It's meant to be, it, it's a teaching, it's teaching tool. Anyways, so this is the Lectio. Oh, and look, the Moravian fire. What is this? Okay, copying the Moravians. Yeah, just scroll. this is me just going through this the first time. What is Lectio Divina? So this is before he said they discovered Lectio Divina. It, they didn't discover it. It, it. They were looking for ways to go deeper. And this is the thing. You have to go deeper, always going deeper, deep, the deeper life. There's a um, A.B. Simpson, the founder of the uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance, talked about the deeper life. There's always this deeper deeper thing and it, and it really it really leads to spiritual elitism we're better than you and that's that's what you that when i hear this statement over here we're better we're holier we don't care about the nine to five we don't care about materialism and it's just garbage like literally garbage look at the hipsters and all their i mean they're going to ibiza of course i mean it's just it, it doesn't make any sense that they don't care about those things of course they do so um, let's move on. Then here's the prayer tool, Lectio Divina. So I wanted to show you now the Hollow app here. This is just a, this pop-up came up actually when I came on the website. Pray every day with 30 days free. And this is Jonathan Rumi, as well as some other movie stars and a Catholic priest. I don't know who the, the Catholic priest, I think is pretty popular. I don't know his name. But uh, Jonathan, if Jonathan Rumi, the Jesus the Jenkins Jesus prays with the hollow app, then we definitely need to pray with the hollow app. Sense my sarcasm, please. Do not use the hollow app. I know, I'm sorry. Some of you actually may be getting in this video a advertisement through YouTube from the hollow app. I'm sorry for that. I have no control over what advertisement comes up. Really no control. And I think they probably realized that my material is religious. And so they put the hollow app up there for sure. And I'm sorry, please, please, please. If you get this, I'm going to make an internal advertisement. Do not use the hollow app. Also, don't use this Lectio 365 app. Please, please, please do not use it. The 24-7 prayer movement, the global prayer movement, not just this 24-7 Pete Griggs, which is the sort of the European 24-7 prayer movement. Do not be a part. Do not. It, it is not necessary as a Christian. Now, you may pray, certainly. I'm asking you, please, 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 please pray. But do not be involved in these movements. They have dangerous, dangerous backgrounds, dangerous theological perspectives, Catholic perspectives. The mystic monks founded the thing and created it. It is not Protestant it is a dangerous movement. So please do not get the hollow app, but the hollow app, right here, I'm gonna click this off. I wanted y'all to see that Jonathan Rumi, the Jenkins Jesus promotes the hollow app as well as other guys. So how to pray with Lectio Divina, it's on their website. Here's hollow, how to pray and how to pray the Lectio. Latin translation, divine reading. Here you go. Here's the origin. Many historians and theologians credit St. Benedict of Nursia as the first teacher of the Lectio Divina. St. Benedict spoke to the importance of divine reading in his rule of St. Benedict, encouraging readers to live a life devoted to work and prayer, especially through reading. However, this method of prayer likely originated even earlier than the time of St. Benedict, who passed away during the 6th century. It wasn't until a few centuries ago that you could find a Bible in homes, hotels, Etc. and so forth. Yeah, so here's where uh, it says actually that uh, the, the practice started actually with St. Gregory of Nyssa in 330 to 395 and also encouraged by St. Benedict. So here's the hollow app. Please do not get it. But this shows that they are doing it. They are practicing this practice. So we went over Meister Eckhart, also dangerous that the 24-7 prayer movement would quote Meister Eckhart. You see actually... When I just look at these movements, um, the 24-7 prayer movement, IHOP, et cetera, I see no reformed, I see no mainline Christian theological voices. None. Not a single one. I, when In my coverage of IHOP and Mike Bickle and these movements, I have never, ever, ever seen a quote from someone who is in the mainline Protestant evangelical movement, reformed or even 
on the left of the reform side. I've never, ever, ever seen it. So that just tells you something. I, I'm trying to think. I cannot think of a time when I have ever seen someone even that would say, oh, that, that guy's Arminian or that guy's maybe a little liberal within the Protestant camp. I've never, ever seen them quote a mainline Protestant leader, historian, theologian, etc. I can't think of one. If you can think of one time where Mike Bickle or any of these guys in these movements in the progressive movement has quoted someone in the mainline Protestant camp, left, center, or right, please hit me up. I'd love to see that. That'd be great. I've never seen it. Here's a quick history of Lectio Divina. Um, this is a soul shepherding website, how to do Lectio Divina. So here is one thing I highlighted down here. I wanted y'all to see this six centuries later. Guigo, Guijo, a Cartesian monk known for being contemplative and ascetic. That's another thing. So the Bible's clear. We do not have to be ascetic. Now, there may be some benefit for denying yourself for some reason, but asceticism is not necessary. Here's what it says in Colossians 2, verse 18. It says, let no, and I'm going to keep pounding this. I'm just going to keep pounding and pounding and pounding this till people get it, till you, you as my audience get it. This scripture is so clear. It says, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism. If these movements, 24-7 prayer and or the Catholic movement and or the ascetic monks insist on asceticism, they are trying to disqualify you. How would they disqualify you? They would disqualify you by insisting that works are necessary for salvation. Asceticism is not necessary. They are trying to disqualify you, insisting on works. And they're insisting on the worship of angels, going on in details about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind. How could someone disqualify you by saying that I saw this and that, I went to the third heaven, Mike Bickle claimed he saw all sorts of visions and dreams. None of them happened. He's a liar. And so anybody who tries to disqualify you, they're trying to disqualify you by saying you have to do certain things to be in relationship with God, to be right with God, to have certain visions, to believe my visions, those people are puffed up without reason by their sensuous minds. So going back, these people who insist on asceticism, known for being contemplative and ascetic, elaborated on St. Benedict's practice of Lectio Divina. He systematized the process of Lectio with the four steps that form a spiritual ladder of intimacy with God. Let's scroll down here. I think there is something down here the spiritual ladder. So basically, that, that, that's what Lectio Divina in the end does. I don't think that may be something I saw somewhere else. But Lectio Divina, in principle, asks you to climb a spiritual ladder of intimacy with God. That contradicts everything that Scripture says about salvation by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Let's go over here. Here's the spiritual ladder, I believe. Yeah, Guijo's Ladder of Monks. I mean, this is it just gets wilder and wilder as I, I just dig in a little bit today. Um, an excerpt from the Ladder of Monks. So you reading the sweetness of the blessed life, meditation perceives it, prayer asks for it, contemplation tastes it, reading as it were, puts food whole into the mouth. This actually is saying that you have to do this type of Bible reading, Lectio reading, to be nourished by the text of Scripture. This means that you would have to go through this process to be nourished. And uh, I just reject it. Uh, so reading it, we're put foods into the mouth, meditation, chews it and breaks it up, prayer extracts it, its flavor, contemplation is the sweetness of itself, which gladdens and refreshes, reading words on the outside, meditation on the pith, soft inner part of the feather or the hair, the essential part core. Prayer asks for what we long for. Contemplation gives us delight in the sweetness which we have found. So these four rungs, yeah, concerning these four rungs. And you know, the deeper you get into Lectio Divina, the deeper you could get into all these practices and say, well, I need these things to be able to understand the text of Scripture. And uh, this is the latter reading, meditation, prayer, and contemplation. Like I said in the beginning, I introduced that. I think it was Lectio, Meditatio, Oratio, 
um, responding contemplatio. This is the four ladder method. You're, you're climbing your way to God, basically. So, and uh, so, yeah, that's that. I found this as well as I was doing research. So Chris Roseborough over at Fighting for the Faith has done a Dangers of Lectio Divina. He has some light-hearted moments where he tries to go through and do the Lectio and, and uh, finds that he was doing a text where it says, and Judas went out and hung himself and uh, had to do the Le Lectio Divina to meditate through that passage of Scripture. And that kind of could be challenging with this model. You're supposed to pull out the wonderful, nourishing things, not the, I mean, what do you do with that text if you're doing Lectio with it? Yeah, so then here, of course, of course, of course, of course, the Remnant Radio fellas have on a Lectio Divina expert named Hans Bursma. He's a Catholic theologian. And so, yeah, so here's a few articles. Master's Seminary has put an article. I'll put these all these links in the show notes later on. The Bible and Lectio Divina, helpful tool or a dangerous practice. I found that article helpful. I found this one especially helpful from Tim Challies over at his website, A Danger of Lectio Divina. And I definitely got a lot out of that. So I will put that in the show notes. Now, there's another one here as well. This one was uh, also a good one, Lectio Divina, what is it, what is not, and why is it a dangerous practice? So that was helpful as well. So I got my hands on the program of that retreat that was incorporating Lectio Divina in its material, and this was some of the names that were being promoted in that program, and you can go find resources and stuff. And I looked up Ruth Haley Barton. She also is an author, spiritual director, teacher, founder of the Transforming Center. So one of her visions and uh, what she wants to do, I care about the soul, your soul, my soul, and the soul of our leadership. She writes in her materials on her website, encountering the richness of the broader Christian tradition in the midst of my own desire has led me to reclaim practices and experiences that spiritual seekers down through the ages have used to open themselves to God's transforming work. That is Ruth Haley Barton. Those are just little blurbs that, that obviously show, and you can go through her podcast speaking it's all this contemplative movement work. So let me come out here and uh, uh, kind of go through some of my notes of what I wanted to say today. And um, it has produced Catholic theologies. So the Benedictine monks have gone through Lectio Divina, and those, the results of their study through Lectio Divina has produced Catholic theology, which has pushed us further and further away from solus Christus, the sole work of Christ alone in salvation. And so why would evangelicals, why would Protestants even practice something that has produced Catholic mysticism? That's my question. Uh, another troubling aspect of Lectio Divina is taking one word of scripture out of its context and repeating it. So they'll try to search for divine words in the text. They'll ask you to take the divine word, a, a word, and pull it out of its context and kind of meditate on that word. And this goes against hermeneutical principles. I'll put in the link in the show notes, uh, hermeneutics for dummies. Uh, I did a video quite a long time ago about hermeneutics and kind of just the basic principles of how we understand the text of scripture. What is the science of understanding? Hermeneutics is just the science of understanding ancient texts. And so you do that on all the ancient texts of Scripture, trying to understand its meanings. And so we do that in Christian, the Christian faith. We study the text of Scripture and use hermeneutics to understand it. And context is king. That is one of the may I've said that already today in this show. But you can't only interpret Scripture with taking those text out of those words out of its context. Words taken out of their context and repeated as divine words basically belongs to Eastern mysticism and not to Christian practice. Individual words have no more divine authority than the whole context of what the authors were meaning when they tried to communicate, when they tried to write scripture. Like I said, an author writes a book. They don't mean to write a whole paragraph to give you one word. 
they're trying to communicate and convey something with the whole of the text, not one word out of the text. Now, there are words that are important, of course, in understanding the whole. That's why we look at our Greek and try to understand the Greek as well, because that holds, a, let's say, a, a, a more fundamental meaning. When we have it translated, it can lose some of its effect and lose some of its meaning. Same thing in German and English. I speak German and English, and when I try to translate stuff from German, it's very difficult because you sometimes can't get it like a one-for-one -one meaning. And there's cultures and languages and all, all that same stuff. So that's why it's very helpful to understand Greek, Hebrew, and portions of Scripture are written in Aramaic. But uh, we can go to those ancient texts and look at those words, sometimes the words together, look at that in the con fuller context, and that helps us understand it. You can't take a word out of its context, and that word does not have a deeper meaning than the words altogether, or is not more divine than another word in that context. So Lectio Divina found strong support among the Benedictine ascetics, like, I, like we talked about, and Roman Catholic mystics, and is currently employed by such modern-day heretics as Richard Rohr. I am planning on doing a whole handling of Richard Rohr and his teachings. There's lots out there, but I came across Richard Rohr several years ago myself. And the first person, the first time I ever came across it was in a meeting where someone was teaching and they quoted Richard Rohr. And then someone came up afterwards to me in the meeting, funny enough, because they knew my writing and knew my book and were very appreciative of my book, Divergent Theology. And they said, Richard, how could this person, this speaker, use Richard Rohr. He's a heretic. That's what they said to me. And I was like, okay, you know, I mean, I'd heard of him a little bit, but I mean, actually I thought I mean, he's Catholic. So he started a Catholic uh, monastic order. And so I thought, yeah, of course, well, what, what do we need to even worry about him for? Because, and she was actually saying, you should really look into him. Please, Richard, look into him. He is making a huge impact on evangelicals. He has huge influence with evangelical thinker, thinkers and or progressives. And so his movement as well employs Lectio Divina. We should really take, take heed of that. If we do not agree with their doctrine, with Richard Rohr's doctrine, how can we freely employ a methodology that they use to produce it? Theological ideas have consequences, and methodologies that produce these theologies cannot be disassociated from their methodologies. Here, I, I thought it might be interesting to deal with a portion of my book that I quote and talk about contemplative and meditative Christianity or contemplative and meditative spirituality. I don't actually want to call it Christianity. <laughs> So. Here, let's go over here. I have a long quote from my book. Some other NAR practices are contemplative or meditative, where they teach emptying the mind or repeating one word from the Bible, such as Lectio Divina, which is not a historical Christian meditative practice. Meditation for the Christian is filling our minds with scripture. Some of these practices include chanting and soaking, which are taught in Bethel so schools, sozo ministry. Sozo is the Greek word translated saved, healed, and delivered. And some of y'all have gone through Sozo. You're actually asking me to deal with Sozo and cover it. I'm, I've got lots of stuff on the, on the burners, but I will try to get to it. Uh, according to their website, uh, it means this, this Greek word. I remember when soaking, centering, and contemplative prayer sprung up out of the Toronto Blessing Movement. John and Carol Arnott, in around 2005, launched this idea and certified other prayer centers worldwide. The NAR has wholeheartedly adopted this practice, and now many NAR churches are steeped in the practice of contemplative, centering, or soaking prayer. These practices have added mystical experiences to the blood of Christ. When we add contemplative prayers, soaking prayers, labyrinths, the silence, which also is practiced in in Lectio Divina, centering prayers, breath prayers, or any other additional work to faith— we demean grace and slip back into faith built on works. Only the blood of Christ can usher us into the presence of God, as shown in Hebrews 10, 19. 
I have a few observations at this point about soaking or centering prayer. First, soaking, centering is a new age occult-like practice and historically not accepted as a practice in Christendom, but rather often been rejected. For instance, within Gnostic mysticism, Irenaeus' book Against Heresies deals with this quite at length. It was one of the first Christian books written. (laughs) The first book was Against Heresies. Second, these practices open people up to all sorts of spiritual powers that could be demonically influenced. Thirdly, there is an order of worship laid out for us in the New Testament that we should adhere to. And soaking prayer, centering prayer, or meditative prayer is nowhere found in that order of worship. Fourth, meditation is meant to be practiced by faithful Christians, but not the forms of meditation that are taking place in soaking prayer where participants empty themselves and use sacred words, mantras, they empty their minds, they receive healing from his presence, etc., etc. Christian meditation is wholly other. We are commanded to fill our minds with his word. We fill it. We don't empty it. And prayer and telling God his worth, which is worship. The psalmist showed us how Christian meditation operates when he wrote, On his law, he meditates day and night. So I just wanted to share that section of my book with you because I feel like that is really helpful in understanding what the Christian practice actually is. Because there is a Christian practice of meditation and how these other forms of meditation are actually dangerous for us. I want to read another section quickly of my book uh, by Miller. I quoted Miller J. Erickson on his definition of Gnosticism. Gnosticism was an early heresy that has always kind of followed the church and in different forms come back in the church and reared its ugly head. So here's how he defines Gnosticism. The Gnostic position asserts that over and above the simple gospel, which is all the ordinary spirits can understand, there is a secret higher knowledge reserved for an elite. It is natural enough for people to ask more questions than the gospel answers. The Gnostic movement attempted to give the answers and did so by drawing on religious sources alien to Christianity and amalgamating them with elements of the gospel faith. So Gnosticism is particularly devastating to the message of the gospel because it says that there is a higher knowledge reserved for an elite. This flies in the face of the simple gospel that everyone, no matter status in the world, can comprehend, receive, and trust the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel message and the message of scripture are for all men, not an elite class of people who have the ability to uncover it and its mysteries. Despite the acknowledgement of Gnosticism's heretical history, its ideas of insider secrets continue to this day and are practiced, obviously, here in this practice called Lectio Divina, in which people try to uncover secrets in the text of Scripture and then even record them like in their diaries. So Gnosticism relates to Lectio Divina because it is the same principle you're trying to Uh, understand the secrets of the kingdom. So there are more problems I have with Lectio Divina. It often tried to picture where Jesus was in the room or in the storm or in the steep path or in a boat, etc. In this, actually, this program that I got my hands on, which had Lectio Divina as part of its program, offered you to the participants to try to picture yourself in all the stories of Christ. This is very problematic. What we can do if we do this, if we try to imagine ourselves in the pages of Scripture, we emotionalize and actually decouple our Christian life from the life of the authentic Christ. We can imagine something that might not have happened. The only authentic Christ that we can find is in the pages of Scripture. So if we say, well, Jericho must have been like this, If you imagine yourself, you can actually create an identity, create a Christian life coupled to a Jesus Christ that you have imagined that did not exist. 
So the only true authentic Christ that we can know and worship is found in the pages of Scripture. So if you try to just imagine what it might have been like, even if it's plausible, then you might actually be imagining something that did not happen and the Christ who does not exist. He's a figment of your own imagination. The Jesus of our imagination may be similar to the Jesus of Scripture, but mostly private revelations of Jesus diverge deeply from the Jesus revealed in Scripture. If you've been following my show, you've hopefully seen the coverage I have of Mike Bickle and IHOP, and I went through lots of his sermon material in those episodes, and every single time he had a vision of Jesus Christ, it was different than the Christ of Scripture. Similar, but different. It was, And the reason I can say with 100% assurance that Mike Bickle's visions were false and or figments of his own imagination were that they did not, they diverged from who Christ was and created experiences and things like an asp, like a snake falling from the ceiling in his office. That is not the, we, we just can say beyond a shadow of a doubt, those visions did not happen. He did not go to heaven and, and the like. So when you imagine Jesus in a certain way, you put yourself into, you project yourself actually into the text of scripture, into the story of the pages of scripture, you have possibly created a Jesus that does not exist. Just like Mike Bickle did and just like all these other mystics. So listening to God, letting God talk and recording what he says, this is also tantamount to individual private revelation. We think of the book, The Jesus Call, which was actually written because she wanted more from the text of scripture. She did, the text of scripture was not enough. She wanted more from Jesus. And so Jesus, in her own, Sarah Young, her own ideas, wrote down the text of what Jesus was saying to her. And in the end, she has Jesus talking to her. So what is that? That if Jesus is saying anything and he is actually speaking, then it's tantamount to scripture. If the true Jesus, the Jesus that is in heaven, sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, is speaking to someone and they are also then writing it down and publishing it, giving it to a broad audience, then that is equal or tantamount to Scripture. It must be, because Jesus speaks. When God speaks, it is his word, his eternal word, and should be understood then as Scripture. There's no difference. But we know most of these private revelations diverge deeply from the revealed Jesus of Scripture. Same thing with Sarah Young. Many of the time, I think there's four or five instances where Christ said something or did something in her book, The Jesus Calling, that really contradicts the Christ of Scripture. So listening to God, letting God talk and recording what he says, this is tantamount to individual private revelation. When you record what God has said to you in your Lectio Divina, you could easily place that revelation on par with the revelation of Scripture. Often, Lectio Divina participants are instructed not to evaluate or judge the validity of the messages they receive. Trying not to discern or judge if something has come from God or not is very problematic. Discernment is noble and a godly characteristic as seen in the Bereans in Acts 17, um, Ephesians 5. 1 John 4 talks about discernment. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. Discernment is a noble, noble thing. And it's actually a spiritual gift in the New Testament. So yeah, let's take, for instance, an extreme case. If a participant of Lectio Divina had the feeling that God told them to go harm someone or commit a crime or some kind of immoral thing, would that not be called into question? Turning off your evaluation and judgment are deeply problematic because they're asking you not to judge if God has spoken to you or not and actually just accept all messages as if God is unequivocally speaking to you. 
This is very problematic, again, because I said the one of the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to people when they are saved, one of them, not everyone probably has this gift, is the gift of discernment. And if you don't have, if you if you actually have the gift of discernment and you, like the Divino asked you to turn off your discernment, turn off your judgment, don't judge whether God has spoken to you or not, this could be very problematic. Often uh, Lectio Divina then asks the participants to ask God to confirm the validity of these messages. How does one do that? Outside of the scripture, how does God validate a personal message? This is very, very subjective. Most personal messages, quote unquote, from God in any sense are unverifiable often because the personal nature of them. Such messages cannot be verified in the pages of Scripture, namely because of their personal nature. They're directed at the person's profession, private life, family life, etc. Where can such things be verified in the Bible? That They just can't because it's personal to you. Lectio Divina also uh, asked participants to center or tune into Jesus. That was also in the materials that for this Lectio Divina retreat. And how do we do that? We have to tune in to the right frequency, um, to have to get the same wavelength as Jesus. This adds also works to faith. How do we tune in actually? What radio station can Jesus be found on? Is Jesus on AM or FM bandwidth? Or maybe he's actually on a microwave bandwidth, not even on AM or FM. How do we center or tune in? These are actually Eastern meditative practices. So again, let's go back over here to Ruth Haley Barton. She is often cited and used as a resource in Lectio Divina. For instance, I saw a contemplative program provided by an evangelical mission society, another one, and incorporated Lectio, Lectio Divina and Ruth Haley Barton's citations and resources. So she's got lots of books. She's written books over here. Embracing the Rhythms of Work and Rest from Sabbath to Sabbatical and Back Again, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, Invitation to Retreat. I'm not sure if she has Lectio Divina stuff in there. Pursuing God's Will Together, Sacred Rhythms, I'm sure that has Lectio Divina stuff in it. Sacred Rhythms, Invitation to Solitude and Silence, all these things have Lectio Divina type principles. And she is quoted and cited quite often. Another mission leader talking to one of his missionaries and recommending Ruth Haley Barton for the material to come into solitude, quiet places, etc. So like I said, Ruth Haley Barton on her website there says, we should reclaim practices and experiences that spiritual seekers down through the ages have used to open themselves to God's transforming work. By reclaim practices, I'd be pretty sure she's talking about reclaiming the Catholic tradition, the Benedictine monks, the monastic orders, and all this where Lectio Divina comes from. So within a Ruth Haley Barton's bio, she says she was affected and influenced by the Shalem Institute for Spiritual Formation. Here is that website, the Shalem Institute. And on the Shalem Institute's website, they say, Shalem Institute is grounded in Christian contemplative spirituality and at the same time draws on the wisdom of many religious traditions. We welcome you wherever you are on the path of spiritual discovery. First of all, by this, I'm pretty sure she's talking about Catholic mysticism, and maybe they are as well, the Benedictine tradition where Lectio Divino comes from. On their website here, Shalem talks about communities of men and women who gather around the presence of Christ for the purpose of spiritual transformation in order to discern the will of God. It says the presence of Christ is where they seek to gather around to discern the will of God. But the question is, how can you discern the will of God? How can you discern the presence of Christ? Do you know it's the presence of Christ? My understanding of how we can discern the will of God is sola scriptura and the sufficiency of scripture. We can know the will of God through his word. 
Scripture says it clearly. We have everything we need for life and godliness. It is all we need. We need not add or take anything away from any contrived presence of Christ. You might just get warm and fuzzy feelings and say that's the presence of Christ. Every person who calls himself a believer has the presence of Christ with them already. You don't have to go searching after it. You don't have to go seeking after it. You don't have to go finding it. And it says in the scriptures, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Or where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Christ said all these things. We cannot conjure it up, create an atmosphere for it, do Lectio Divino long enough. In the scriptures, we have all we need for every good work. When we renew our minds with it, we are able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It says it in Romans 12, 1 and 2. And in uh, 1 Timothy, we see what scripture is and what its effect is. It says it here in 1 Timothy 3, 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. Learned it from his grandmother and his mother. And how from child you, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings of the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Scriptures are useful for. They're able to make us wise unto salvation. And then he says what Scripture is here. This is the nature of Scripture. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete or thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have everything we need. We can be completed. We can be thoroughly equipped for everything. And then um, he says what to do with the word. And we miss that. We, you know, we just, Sometimes we just read verse 16 and we don't jump to chapter 4. Paul says, to and charges Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And this is actually what is happening in Lectio Divina. People are not satisfied with sound teaching. They won't endure it, it says right here. They will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they want to something to sound lovely to them, something to tickle their senses, to suit their own passions. They will gather together themselves, accumulate themselves, people who will suit their own passions. That's actually what's happening in Lectio Divina. It's not enough. The Bible's not enough. Even Sarah Young, who wrote the Jesus Calling, she said it was not enough. She wanted more. She was looking for more, and she wanted to suit her own passions in the end. The question is, is Christ and his word enough for you? Is it sufficient? Do you believe that God, through the writers of Scripture, has given you everything you need, or do you actually think you need more? Are you content with what God has given you is the question, is really what it comes down to. So here, this Shalem Institute basically says, um, we draw from the wisdom of many religious traditions, and that is perennialism. Perennialism is the belief that all religions share one common truth or divine reality and come from the same core truth or source. No matter how different they appear externally, different religions, they have the same core truth. In this idea of perennialism, God is usually spoken of in the abstract terms or abstract forms like presence, the divine, the one. Perennialism also teaches that there is a divine reality underneath and inherent in the world of things. There is the human soul or natural capacity similarly and longing for this divine reality. And Finally, the God of existence is union with divine reality. These are all ideas in perennialism, which stand completely opposed to Christian belief and the exclusivity of Christ. So that's perennialism. This is Shalem Institute who promotes perennialism, and it is not 
a part of the Christian life and practice. That is a dangerous, dangerous belief, drawing on the wisdom of many religious traditions. So again, these movements and contemplative spirituality draw on many religious traditions, meaning other religions, New Age, and ultimately occult-like practices. Also on their website, they say, living contemplatively is essential in today's often chaotic and challenging world. It's a way to live a truly authentic life, anchored in prayer, spiritually discerning and responsive to God. So again, the hubris comes forward. They're only, if you live contemplatively, you are only living the truly authentic life. No one else is authentic except those who engage in Lectio Divina or contemplative lives. So that is also where the hubris and the extreme pride and the arrogance come in that they are only alone able to live truly authentic lives. So that's the Shalem Institute and that um, these two people, authors, this author, Ruth Haley Barton, is offered up as great resources in the Lectio Divina practice. And Shalem Institute is the institute, the spiritual life institute that Ruth Haley Barton has learned quite a bit from. And they are perennialists. They believe that they're, all truth is God's truth and the light. And, and so coming down to it, I, as far as I can tell from the Shalem's website, there is no emphasis on gospel belief but just this nebulous path of spiritual discovery. And so I, I've not seen any gospel presentation. I've not seen a Christian value. I've not seen a Christian statement of faith anywhere on their website. The question for me arises, can, can I create my own path of spiritual discovery? Or must I believe the gospel and trust in Christ and Christ alone? A and then my spiritual life begins. It seems like according to this institute and to Lectio Divina advocates that spiritual formation is what you make of it, basically. The Christian regeneration is not necessary, but Christian regeneration is absolutely necessary. Otherwise, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, as Ephesians 2.1 says, and we cannot be truly spiritually alive until God makes us alive together with Christ in Ephesians 2 verse 5. So this is also on their website, Shalem's website, again, which offers Lectio Divina and other spiritual practices, which Ruth Haley Barton also is very influenced by. And so here is a section on there, what is spirituality? And I'll just read here, in many traditions, the word spirit refers to life force, the basic energy of being. Symbolically, spirit is the breath of life. The Hebrew ruach, Greek pneuma, Latin spiritus, and Sanskrit prayana, pray, prayna, I don't know exactly how to say that. Hope I'm getting it right. All mean both breath and spirit. Traditionally, this life force is seen as manifest in our love, in the passions and inspirations that motivate us and connect us with the world and with one another. This last statement is found on their website, like I said, under their contemplative spirituality section. This is an anti-Trinitarian and treats the spirit as an impersonal life force, not as a personal being. The third person of the Holy Trinity, the Spirit of God, is a personal being. This is a New Age spirit, not the Spirit of Christ, as he has been revealed in Scripture. It's also the basis, or what you, you could say this is pantheism, basically. Pantheism is the belief that God, there's a spirit, the Spirit of God is in all things, in creation. This is not a Christian view. That there is a life force in all things. Think Star Wars, you know, the force be with you. According to my quick research into Ruth Haley Barton and this Shalem Institute, it's pretty clear to me that this form of spirituality finds its roots in perennialism, that belief, again, that God's truth is all truth, or all truth is God's truth. This is not Christian, folks. In a sweeping look at these two resources, which were provided in a spiritual retreat on a weekend in a Christian missions materials, these people, I would very strongly encourage you 
your church, your mission organization, your Christian school, your seminary, and any other Christian organizations to stay away. Stay away from Lectio Divina. Stay away from this Shalem Institute if you've ever had any encounters with it and connections with it. Ruth Haley Barton, stay away. And I'll just keep that quote up there for you to show you that it is Star Wars The Force, basically. I recently saw the printout for a contemplative program that employed Lectio Divina. They asked the participant to think and visualize what you hear, smell, think, feel, see. What do you see around you? What does the Jericho look like? What is the temperature? Where is Bartimaeus? How big is the crowd? What's the mood of the crowd? This right here is actually borderline astral projection. You project yourself into the scenario in that time. And uh, so I found this very, very troubling. And maybe even to travel outside your physical body to explore other realms of time and space. Again, this is not a Christian practice. We don't look into the text of Scripture this way to place ourselves or imagine ourselves into the text or into the time and the story of the Bible. We can be taught what it was like, and, and, and we can understand the context and maybe think about it and try to picture what it was like, but to see ourselves there and imagine the details, literally feeling stuff, touching things, smelling things, sensing things, seeing things, imagining what the crowds were talking about or looking like. That is very, very tenuous and possibly even dangerous because astral projection is dangerous. <laughs> it is a dangerous, dangerous thing to practice. Christians should not be practicing projection of any type where you project yourself into some other time and space, for instance. So we have covered quite a bit of ground here today. And I wanted to jump over here. Now we've kind of interspersed the scripture, but I want to come over here and look at what we ought to be doing with scripture. Lectio Divina is something I believe we should not practice. It is a Catholic mystic practice and should not be practiced by faithful Christians, whether you belong to the 24-7 prayer movement or not. If you belong to the 24-7 prayer movement, I would beg you, please, please come out. It is not necessary. Prayer is absolutely necessary. It is a part of the Christian life, but it is unnecessary for you to be pressed to pray 24 hours a day, seven days a week, overnight, in the middle of the night, fast and pray and do all these things that this movement begs of you to do, expects of you to do. It's not necessary. Now, fasting and prayer are wonderful things when you choose to do it, but to demand that of people is not necessary. All right, so here is what Scripture says. What we, how we ought to use Scripture in a continual way is 1 Timothy 4, verse 13. He says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy until the, when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourselves in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on your teaching, meaning teach the word, pay attention to the word, but also watch your own life. Persist in these things, for in so doing, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Preach the word, read the word publicly, teach it, watch your own life. Take care that your own life is in order. And if you persist in these things, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Another scripture I wanted to focus on. So in other words, the word of God should be read out loud in public to us as the body of Christ. So, and what else is scripture? It is in 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21, Peter writes this, knowing first of all that no prophecy of scripture come from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they carried, were carried along by the Holy Spirit. God spoke to these men, and they have given us these things. They're not their own interpretation. They are produced by God. Men spoke from God, carried along by the Holy Spirit, and thus we have the Scriptures. So we can know in the pages of the Scripture, we have what God wants us to know.
let's conclude here with saying a few things. Instead of personal Lectio Divina practices, what could we do? What what should we do, Richard? What would be, if you're thinking about taking a retreat, so the reason I became aware of this and being used largely in the evangelical movement and evangelical missions movement was because I uh, was be, became aware of a organization that was having a personal retreat, offering it to their missionaries. And so this Lectio Divina was included as part of the personal retreat that people that was being offered. So what could we do in lieu of Lectio Divina? What would be some good spiritual practices for me? And so I just got a list of a few things here. If you wanted to do a personal quiet time or personal retreat or some personal reflection, here's what you could do. Just a quick, real simple outline read scripture, maybe large books, maybe chapters, or look for certain themes. You Say you want to address a theme, then get together several scriptures to put together a theme. Read scripture. Don't read it in Lectio Divina looking for certain things, looking for divine words. You read scripture, maybe even a whole book, maybe take the book of Ephesians. And that is a powerful, power-packed book that will really blow you away. Read it. Then journal about what you've read through scripture and learn through that process. That journal, however, is not scripture. It's not that God is speaking to you. You have what you have read in scripture. Now journal about that. Yeah. Then pray, pray, ask God to help you adore God. I like the acts of prayer, A-C-T-S, adore God, confess your sin, confess where you fall short. Thank him for all he's done for us in Christ Jesus. If you happen to read through Ephesians, it's amazing. So thank him for all he's done for us in Christ Jesus. And then supplication is just a fancy way of saying, giving your prayers and petitions and requests to God. So A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That's a great, you've already got an hour gone right there in a personal retreat then maybe take a group with you, fellowship with others on what they've learned and are hearing from God through the word of God and not through their feeling, hearing, contemplation, tuning their ears to hear, centering themselves or anything like that. What is the word of God saying to you all? Mutually encourage each other. Then sing. The Bible says, make music in your hearts, addressing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's a real simple, I mean, you could fill up an entire day with that. You could have more than one session. You could uh, organize it any way you wanted, but read scripture, journal about it, have people write about it, have people speak to each other, pray, fellowship with each other, speak to each other, mutually encourage each other, and then sing together and worship God. So let me close with this. The challenge with Lectio Divina is that you actually treat Scripture as something that it's not. Scripture is God's message to man. And when you do Lectio Divina, you actually take it and you cut it up and you sparse it up and you take words out and you take thoughts out and you let things jump out to you in Scripture that is the first words that hit you or whatever. And Scripture is not meant to be read that way. The hermeneutical principle is that Scripture is meant to be read how the authors intended you to understand it. So in hermeneutics, in Scripture interpretation and understanding, we are trying to get as close as we can to the author's intent. The authorial intent is what hermeneutics seeks to get us to. We want to try as best we can through context, through understanding the times, through understanding background, through understanding the language of the time, to get as close as we can to the author's original intent. When you practice Lectio Divina, you do not seek out the author's original intent, which was, if we're looking at the authors, Paul, the apostle, Peter, John, who wrote the Revelation and uh, the Gospel, when he wrote those things, he had an intent. And God had given him that intent. So when you actually read the scripture and try to get to the author's original intent, then you're getting to understand what God's message is for you and for me. 
So when we try to do Lectio Divina or other contemplative way, ways of understanding Scripture, we are departing from authorial intent. And thus, we're not actually hearing God and what his message is to man. So another challenge with uh, Lectio Divina and other practices like this, contemplative practices, is what we understand as private revelations. And John Owen spoke quite at length on private revelations. And I appreciate, I think I've mentioned this in a show previously, that John Owen had written all this and J.I. Packer summarized it for us so we don't have to get through the difficult, the weeds of John Owen's language. He said, J.I. Packer summarized John Owen's understanding of private revelations in this way. He said, if private revelations agree with scripture, they're needless. And if they disagree, then they're false. So there's also this challenge of if God is speaking to you and saying that you have uh, to go to this job or giving you some private revelation according to your personal life, it's unverifiable according to scripture. So that's the problem. Now, does God lead and guide and direct? Certainly. He led us to the mission field here. And that was his will, of course. And, and so there is a sense, of course, in which you are led and guided and directed by God's omniscient, omnipotent, and sovereign hand. He does lead us. But private revelations must agree with Scripture. If they do not agree with Scripture, then they are redundant and unnecessary. If they disagree, then they're not from Scripture nor from God. With this movement, with contemplative ways of trying to have private revelation, they display that they disagree with the sufficiency of Scripture. The sufficiency of Scripture says that the Scriptures alone are sufficient and as a source of revelation from God with no other sources of revelation, either prudent or necessary for faith and life. And if anything were to be added as revelatory sources, then it displays that the Scriptures are neither sufficient nor authoritative for that person. I also want to reiterate that Scripture is understandable. There is this theological concept of the perspicuity of Scripture. Scripture is perspicuous. It's understandable. Perspicuous is just a fancy word for saying that things should be understandable. They're clear. They're, they're, you can enough to know God's will for man. And so Scripture is perspicuous. It gives us everything we need to understand how we ought to relate to God, how we can find peace with God through Jesus Christ, and how we are to know the will of God. So Scripture is all we need for life and godliness. We need not Lectio Divina. We need not contemplative prayer. We don't need perennialism because perennialism is a false religion anyways. It's trying to syncretize or mix and match other sources, other religious sources with that of Christianity. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. That's his own claim of himself. And so if we add or mix and match other religious sources to that of Christianity, we falsify it. So that is a long show, longer than I had imagined, but I hope and pray it was beneficial for you and that you will please, please, I beg you, avoid contemplative forms of spirituality, avoid Lectio Divina, avoid perennialism, avoid Richard Rohr. I'll do a show later on him and why we ought to specifically avoid him. Avoid these other teachers, avoid other teachings. Please, 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 if you are involved in the 24-7 prayer movement, come out. Lectio Divina and the other things that they mention, even in that video of 25 years of celebration, are harmful to your spiritual life. Scripture is all you need for life and godliness, and Christ will help you build the foundation on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ and his word, and you need no other source. So I hope and pray that helped you today. If you like what you heard, please do me a favor and click the like button, hit the subscribe and smash that bell. It helps us get this information and content out to more people. If you'd like more information about my ministry, you could look up richardpmore.net. I also blog at richardpmore.blogspot.com. You're welcome to follow me on X, formerly Twitter, at richardm23 is my handle. 
please feel free to email us at firmfoundationshow at gmail.com. That's firmfoundationshow at gmail.com. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Until next time, God bless you and take care. So that on Jesus has leaned for repair.